The classification of scoliosis is broken down into three main categories. And the first category is something that's called mild scoliosis. And these are curves that are less than 25 degrees. And then there's moderate scoliosis that's between 20 and 40 to 45 degrees. And then severe scoliosis when we get greater than 40 to 45 degrees. This is when scoliosis is typically, scoliosis surgery is typically recommended. Now, interesting enough, when we come to scoliosis surgical cases, that degree or threshold for scoliosis surgery is different depending on what country you live in. Some countries actually consider to do surgery at a smaller curve, like 35 degrees or so. And other countries um, actually have recommendations for surgical, uh, surgical intervention at much higher degrees, like 50 or 55. So there's a gray area actually of when surgical threshold is actually recommended or when a curve achieves a certain number. Here in the US, it's a between 40 to 45. That's typically what we're looking at. Now, unfortunately, is a lot of the care that's done prior to this size curve is normally not geared at stopping curves from actually getting there. They're, a lot of the care is funneling patients more towards surgery as opposed to being very proactive in trying to stop a curve from becoming that size to actually prevent surgery and have a good long-term outcome. So this is some of the shortcomings in the, the actual the treatment process before they actually become surgical. However, once a curve becomes surgical and somebody's considering surgery, what's actually involved in that? Like what does a patient actually do when they go through a surgical treatment? Like what's actually gonna happen? When somebody's gonna actually make the decision to have scoliosis surgery, what's actually involved with that surgery in terms of what actually is occurring. Unfortunately, it's exactly what the words say. It's spinal fusion. It's, it's everything that's involved with fusing the spine. Typically, the affected area is anywhere between 12 to 14 vertebrae. So meaning they're typically going somewhere around L4, which is, uh, I'm sorry, around L2, which is a, uh, a lower lumbar all the way up to an area roughly about T3, T4. That's the most common surgical area. And in those vertebra, there will be pedicle screws or screws that are actually put into the spine um, all the way down with two rods on each side of the spine trying to fuse the spine together. Also, what's happening is they're actually removing vertebra a bone. They're actually taking off some of the vertebra, the posterior aspects of the back half, a half of the bones. They're actually removing those, undoing the muscles and ligament attachments. And they're also removing the discs in between the bones and they're using bone graft to actually in between each vertebra to actually fuse it. So not only are they fusing it with metal and rods, they're also fusing it with bone grafts. So what happens is those area becomes completely immobile and no longer moves the way a spine is supposed to move. This is the most common form of something of spinal fusion. Before this version, there was an older version, something called Harrington rods. Even though this is kind of still considered a Harrington rod style, Harrington rods only had screws on the very top and the bottom, and they had hooks that it hooked into the spine and tried to, to try to stop the curve from progressing. Now they're using more pedicle screw systems that are screwing into the vertebra all the way through the length of the, of the, the fusion. So somebody with a spinal fusion could have 20, 30 screws actually attaching the rods directly into the spine, and the idea is to try to stop the rods from coming out. Other forms of scoliosis surgery can be something called spinal tethering. Spinal tethering is where they actually use screws, but instead of using a rod, they use a cable to try to pull the spine straight. Now, the problem with spinal tethering, it's relatively a new surgery, and there's actually less data regarding spinal tethering than there is regarding spinal fusion. And spinal fusion, in terms of scoliosis fusion, there's not a lot of good long-term data on that too. So both these types of surgeries don't have or have very little long-term data, meaning long-term 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So when somebody goes through scoliosis surgery, the unknown answer is what's gonna happen 20, 30, 40 years from now? Nobody really knows. And I think that's the reason why most people are really trying to f figure out another way to try to manage and deal with their scoliosis other than just waiting, it, waiting for it to get to a size where they actually have or need scoliosis surgery. Scoliosis spinal surgery or scoliosis spinal fusion was initially designed not even to really reduce the scoliosis, but the primary purpose of scoliosis surgery is one thing. It's to try to stop more progression. So they're willing to risk complete motion and mobility of the spine just to stop the curve from actually getting any worse. So 
even though today's standards with scoliosis surgery, they do achieve some reduction, but the remember, the reduction is not, not something that's their initial goal. In fact, most surgeons will tell you they can't guarantee any type of reduction because their when their first goal is to try to fuse it so it doesn't worsen anymore. So that's the initial goal of scoliosis surgery. And of course, it's a very invasive surgery just trying to stop the curve from worsening. All types of surgeries carry some type of risk, but the more invasive the surgery is, the more risk it tends to carry. A scoliosis surgery is a high risk surgery because screws are being installed directly to the spine where there's very delicate nerves and spinal cord. So therefore the precision or the exactness of which way these screws have to be installed makes this case more risky. Also, we're taking a part of the spine or part of the body that was meant to move and we're immobilizing it with metal and hardware that can also has its own level of complication. And then we're also removing a bunch of tissue and we're and using bone grafts to try to create a fusion between two bones artificially. That creates a, sec, a third level of risk. So all these things to combined mean it's a, it's a high risk case. What are some of the things that can unfortunately happen? Well, one of the largest risks associated with scoliosis surgery is actually rejecting the rods altogether, that your body doesn't take this, this, these rods inappropriately. These are foreign substances in your body. Your body has an immune system that reacts to foreign substances. So therefore you can have a massive reaction just to that one thing. I've had patients, unfortunately, that have had allergic reactions to the rod or an immune system response to the rods. And they have to have these rods removed immediately because they're causing other types of issues. It's kind of like your body's almost attacking it, it, not itself, but it's attacking the rod, so it's in this massive inflammatory state. Um, the screws can go through improperly, meaning they don't go in right directly to the bone. They can uh, unfortunately um, go through nerves or damage nerve tissue, which can cause to all types of neurological dysfunction. It can cause strength and weakness to extremities. It can affect motor control. I've had, unfortunately, you've had patients that have had surgeries done that they, the, spinal, the, the screw has gone through a nerve and can affect the entire function of a leg or, or part of the body, which is unfortunate. Um, screws can actually come out of the spine. They, therefore, when they get, they get installed, they can actually pull directly out as a result of the surgery. That's a, a further complication. Rods can bend within the spine itself, meaning the curves can still progress post-surgery and they can fail. Um, there's also failed back surgery syndrome. Now, failed back surgery syndrome is actually a diagnosis because failed back surgery actually happens unfortunately, relatively often. So therefore they have a diagnosis code that allows them to go back in there and create a new diagnosis to do a second surgery. And the ultimate thing, and the reason why they have to wait to do surgery while kids are growing, because if kids are growing and they actually fuse the spine, they actually stop growth wherever those rods are. So therefore they have to wait, wait for patients to get to a certain age before they can actually fuse it. While they're waiting, these curves have, unfortunately, a risk of progressing, which can make the surgery even more complicated. So there's a lot of risks associated with surgery, and I believe anybody who's looking at a spine says you're better off without a surgery, without rods in your spine, than you are with them if you can control the scoliosis, if you can stop the curve from progressing. However, if you have surgery, what does that recovery thing look like? Well, that recovery really kind of looks like a lot like how invasive the surgery was. Because the surgery was so invasive, somebody doesn't go in you know, for one day and walk out the next day with a rod fusion. I mean, it takes a week. You're looking at, at a week of, re of most of the time, you're gonna be still in the hospital recovering from this type of surgery. So it's a, it's it's not a, a one day thing. It, you're, it's a week long recovery, probably minimally. And you know during the surgery itself is, you know, eight hours, it's a full day thing. It's not like you're going in and coming out. So it's a relatively long recovery. This recovery is normally tiered, like and normally like every 90 days, 90 days to six months, six months to a year. It can take a full year to kind of get back to doing some of the things that you were doing prior to surgery and you may never get all the way back. That's a realistic um, scenario. However, most kids tend to recover function um, probably pretty well even though there's gonna be some deficiencies more than likely. The length of recovery initially for the first few months 
are very limited, meaning they don't want you bending, they don't want you twisting, they don't want you doing a lot of movements to your spine because they don't want to risk the screws coming out of the spine since the bone fusion or the bone grafts are still taking place, right? That's what we're looking for. Normally within that three to six month range, they're allowing you to do a little bit more stuff. But again, they don't want you really stressing your spine out too much because they want those bone grafts to take in. So where the, the, the fusion is no longer dependent upon the rods and screws, but are now depending upon where they've removed the discs and they added those bone grafts. And now those bone grafts want to take in place. Six months plus is where those bone grafts are starting to really take into place. And this is where they start loosening up restrictions. But most cases, most surgeons are not going to say, okay, go do whatever you want. They're normally going to have some restrictions on what you're doing because you still have metal in your body and you're, this is something that you have to manage your whole life. So this entire recovery stage we know happens a lot faster or easier for children than it is adults. Everything we just talked about in terms of recovery is much more difficult for an adult patient than a child. So that's the reason why scoliosis surgery is normally not recommended as quickly or as often for an adult patient. Now, because of this, because of all this complication and this amount of time it takes to recover from scoliosis surgery, scoliosis surgery should really only be considered as a last resort type of treatment, meaning all types of treatments should be exhausted to try to prevent surgery from actually occurring. Because if we really think about what's the primary goal of scoliosis surgery, scoliosis surgery is really only goal, the only goal there is really to try to stop the curve from progressing. Remember, it doesn't fix what caused, this is, caused your scoliosis. It doesn't correct scoliosis. It's just trying to stop it. So is there a way that we could stop your curve without going through all this risk and not removing all this function of your spine because when you have scoliosis surgery, it's fusing everything. So everything that was supposed to move is no longer moving. Everything that's supposed to do in your spine, it's no longer doing. So are, you, are we going to be willing to lose all that to make your spine straighter? Well, is there a way that we can achieve stability or even better yet, some reduction that still keeps your spine functioning properly? So this is really the question that we're asking. Is that possible? Is there a way to actually prevent that from ever occurring without assuming all of those risks associated with scoliosis surgery? So if somebody's considering scoliosis surgery, what questions should you be asking yourself? What are things should be, you should be considering? First thing is, have you explored all your risks, all, all, the, all, all the risks associated with scoliosis? Do you surgery, do you know what you're really taking on when it comes to putting a rod in your spine? Number two is, have you looked at all the other approaches that could possibly help you deal with your scoliosis? Meaning, are you just barely surgical level and we reduce it a little bit, you'll be out of those numbers? Is it more of a functional or is it more of a, you know, what are you looking to achieve? Is there other ways to deal with it? That, that's number two. And if you remember, if you're unhappy with the results of an alternative approach, meaning if you don't have surgery and things are not going, you can always have surgery later. But once you put rods in your spine, I mean, there are some decisions you just can't take back. And that is one of them, right? Putting screws and rods in your spine, removing all those bones, removing all the muscles, removing the discs and using bone grafts. That's not something easily undone. So you should know that this is the only way you want to go. This has got to be 100% the, the decision that you want to make because it's very difficult to go back once scoliosis surgery is performed. And more importantly, once it's failed, right? Once scoliosis surgery has failed and it's gone, it's gone down that path, it's very difficult to undo. So make sure that this is something that you've really considered and you looked at all your approaches in terms of what you can do to manage and deal with scoliosis outside of only dealing with scoliosis surgery.